Now, ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming our keynote, Mr. Andreas Wollner. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you for the kind introduction, Jeff. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank the AeroDev Manufacturing Execution Committee and SME for the invitation to present at AeroDev. It is a great honor and pleasure for me talking to you today. Giving a keynote speech is always exciting, but in this case, it is even more so since you are representing the creme de la creme of the aerospace and defense industry here in Fort Worth, a region with a long and impressive aviation history. In preparation of this event, I asked myself which meaningful insights I could share with you. Taking these thoughts into account, I changed the bold title of my keynote, Where the Industry is Going in Carbon and Why, to a more specific question, CFRP, Can the Aerospace and Defense Industry Learn from Automotive? This is a much better fit, and I feel comfortable with this headline, since I have some automotive and carbon fiber composites industry experience working with SGL Group for more than 20 years now. SGL Group is among the top three carbon fiber producers worldwide with regards to capacity and has a global network of production plants from oxidized and carbon fiber precursors. You see it on the chart, maybe you can see it, the blue dots, um, to carbon fibers in black, materials in red, and composite parts designated with a yellow dot. However, our forte is automotive and not aerospace, like our Japanese and American main competitors. Looking at SGL Group's composite business from a regional perspective, we are a German stock-listed company with a strong U.S. footprint. In the U.S., we have three different sites. Arkadelphia, Arkansas, producing fabricated insulations for the aerospace industry, and Gardena, California, serving several markets from aerospace to automotive and industrial applications. Both sites belong to our subsidiary, Hitco Carbon Composites. Moses Lake, Washington, is our American hub for high tau count carbon fiber production, offering a lot of space for future growth. The site was founded as a joint venture between BMW Group and SGL Group for the dedicated supply of BMW vehicles. This changed and the Moses Lake plant became an integral part of the SGL Group production network, no longer limited to the sole supply of BMW. I had the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be involved in designing and building up the dedicated global supply chain for BMW, stretching from carbon fiber precursor to textile materials. We had started in 2008 with the materials development for the Mega City vehicle, which became the BMW i3, a purpose-designed battery electric vehicle with the start of production in 2013. Since then, we came a long way until the launch of the carbon core BMW 7 Series model in 2015. Believe me, being a tier one sub automotive supplier isn't always fun. However, the partnership has been very solid and fruitful over the years, and I have to admit, I learned a lot regarding uh, serious manufacturing with carbon fibers in the automotive industry. Since 18 months now, I'm leading the Composites Fiber and Materials Business Unit, one of the two pillars of SGL Group. Hence, I feel comfortable to share some of my views what the aerospace industry may learn from automotive regarding large-scale CFRP production. When you read through the aerospace and defense reports compiled by industry experts, many different challenges are listed. Just to name a few, your industry faces digitization of business models, cost pressure from governments and private sector, advancing manufacturing technologies, the Internet of Things, we will hear about this later during the panel discussion, the strive for permanent product performance improvement, and so on. Many of these trends are not new, but will impact the aerospace and defense industry heavily. No matter what digitization will change, flying will always need best-in-class hardware. Manufacturing will always be a challenge in aerospace and defense. Each defense system generation must demonstrate increased performance and each commercial airplane generation must improve passenger comfort and reduce the cost of transportation. 
new technologies, be it in product or production technology, must be introduced, leading to significant investments. However, the current economic situation, low interest rates, low oil prices, availability of financing, and increasing air traffic led to an all-time high in the manufacturing backlog of approximately 10,000 planes at Airbus and Boeing. Let's get to the core of my keynote today. Are there things the aerospace and defense industry can learn from the automotive industry? Where does the aerospace and defense industry, having introduced carbon fibers decades ago, stand in comparison to the automotive industry? Wouldn't it be great to build the next generation of single aisle commercial aircraft in the second half of the 2020s with a significant percentage of carbon fiber composites? How can this be achieved? I'd like to take to, I'd like to give you some insight into how serious manufacturing with CFRP looks like in the automotive industry, especially at BMW, and how we finally managed to overcome some of the challenges. The usage of carbon fiber reinforced plastics in commercial airplanes began in the late 1960s when Boeing introduced such materials to the 737-747 models. Airbus followed with the A300, however the percentage of the airframe weight remained in the single digit order of magnitude for a long time. CFRP utilization in new commercial aircraft programs showed a steady increase from approximately 5% to 15% between 1970 and 2000. In those early years, CFRP was mainly used in secondary structures. Since 2000, driven by the new A380, B787, and A350 programs, the CFRP content in the aircraft structure surged to above 50% in the Dreamliner and A350. Now, CFRP is, ex is also extensively used in primary aircraft structures with the highest performance requirement. But carbon fiber composites remain expensive and the manufacturing process is more complicated and typically takes longer compared to other materials. The aerospace and defense industry was always at the forefront of the technology development for carbon fiber based parts, as listed in this slide. Numerous types of high performance carbon fibers, materials, manufacturing and curing methods have been developed over time. However, the aerospace and defense industry typically doesn't have to care about tech time as the automotive industry has to. When you look at the build rates of automobiles, thousands per month compared, uh, compared to the commercial aircraft build rates of tens per month, it becomes evident that the existing manufacturing technologies are not adequate for further market penetration in aerospace and defense. Let's have a look at how the build rates of the single aisle airliners will grow within the next years. Think about 10 to 12 twin aisles, A350 or 787 aircraft per month. Doing the math with 20 average work days results in 0.5 aircraft per day or a tech time of something like 2,880 minutes. Compare this to a tech of approximately five minutes, which comes close to the BMW 7 Series production. Building the Airbus A350 or Boeing 787 requires a production rate of one, one wing per day by 2020. This is doable with autoclave technologies, but imagine if six wings per day for the single aisle planes, the A320 or B737s, had to be manufactured with CFRP. How should this be achieved? Who, sh who could and would afford such investments? If we do not learn from the painful lessons the automotive industry suffered from, carbon fibers will not make it into the next generation of single aisle planes. Today's CFRP adoption of up to 50% of the airframe weight in Boeing's and Airbus twin aisle models is remarkable. However, this development took four waves and began more than 40 years ago. We expect the usage of carbon fiber in commercial aircraft to reach a plateau around 2020. Until then, build rates will go up and the 777X will have entered into service. However, due to the longevity of the supply contracts, I don't, see many, I don't see major changes in the supply base. The usage of carbon fibers in the next generation of single aisle planes, which may enter into service during the second half of the next decade, will heavily depend on two factors. First, is there a viable business case for the use of 
CFRP in comparison to other materials? And second, will the required low tech times be achieved with capable manufacturing technologies? Looking at the state of the art autoclave production value chain, I'm skeptical that this will be the path forward. I do believe that highly automated out of the autoclave technologies must be implemented to achieve low tech times. Looking at the evolution of carbon fiber composites in the automotive industry, a similar historic development can be observed. And when you look at that chart with the evolution of carbon fiber composites in the automotive, um, starting at the left with the racing cars going uh, to the right, the Vision 2030, um, over time, on the y-axis, you see the production volumes. Um, and it all started with carbon fiber prefrag monocoques for racing and super sports cars cured in autoclaves in the 1980s. We are talking here about uh, one to 10, maybe to a few hundred of super sports cars, monocoques being produced. Um, this is still the prevailing technology for expensive low volume cars. Then um, in the 2000s, um, roofs and hang on parts found their way into larger production volumes, up to a few thousand vehicles per year. That is uh, with the picture with the Audi, so um, mirror caps, uh, class A carbon, surfaces, uh, roofs uh, started to evolve. Uh, we are talking about something like thousands and maybe some ten thousands of vehicles per year, but still small series. And by the end of the 1990s, BMW had started their CFRP in-house development. They gained a lot of experience in small series applications such as CFRP roofs or bumper structures for the famous M models. And it wasn't until 2008 when they started to investigate the future of mobility with a project team called uh, Project I. And one of the objectives was to develop a vehicle for the world's megacities. They started testing with uh, converted uh, mini vehicles, converted to battery electric vehicles, and one year later, BMW had to decide between uh, building such a mega city vehicle um, on an aluminum chassis with a carbon fiber passenger compartment mounting on a, um, they had to decide between either doing it aluminum chassis or doing it with a um, carbon fiber reinforced plastic um, passenger compartment mounted on an aluminum frame. And as you may know, they decided in favor of the carbon fiber solution and started to develop the underlying product and production technologies for the car that became the BMW i3 battery electric vehicle. And that is what you see in the 2013 column, that is the BMW i3, uh, with that passenger compartment made of CFRP, the entire compartment is made of it, uh, called the live cell, and then you have the drive cell, which is basically the underlying aluminum structure. The passenger compartment, and that was something new, is made from several plies of 50K carbon fiber, unidirectional non-crimped fabrics of different area weights and orientations. Hence, the designers had full flexibility to add plies where needed without inflating the number of base materials. So right from the beginning, it was about how can you scale this thing up? How can you develop further variants without inflating um, the material base? The stacking of such plies is performed in fully automated production lines. Molding and infiltration with epoxy resin is done by high pressure resin transfer molding of the preform or by compression molding followed by oven curing. Numerous hurdles had to be overcome for setting up the technology for a capacity of more than 30,000 units per year. However, these learnings were the foundation for the next development step, 
the so-called carbon core of the recent BMW 7 series. This set of different technologies allows for the combination of several materials, conventional steel, press-hardened steel, aluminum, and CFRP in the vehicle chassis. That is the next column, the 2015. You see the recent BMW 7 series um, with that uh, multi-material mix, combining different materials and having carbon fibers um, as reinforcements uh, where needed. Um, and um, when you look to the right-hand side, you see the vision. Um, the vision uh, we see for the future, which will uh, go even beyond that. With the 7 Series, we're talking something like um, 60 to maybe uh, 70,000 vehicles per year. But when you think beyond that, um, 100,000 of vehicles per year, I think we will see a very selective usage of CFRP. We will see thermoplastic um, CFRP applications, and um, we will see, of course, a lot of local reinforcements. That's what we will see there. We will not see um, a monolithic um, carbon fiber reinforced plastic structure, uh, but we will see that, uh, and we will have to look for areas where it makes sense to, to um, implement carbon fibers. Another advantage of the integration into the standard manufacturing and assembly process at the assembly plant in Dingolfing, uh, Germany, um, is really how it could be integrated. Um, I'll come to the various parts made from carbon fibers in the latter part of the keynote. In 2009, we began to set up the unique supply chain for BMW's i3, i8, and 7 series models. The 50K polyacrylonitrile precursor is spun in our Japanese joint venture in Otake, Japan. From there, it is being shipped in boxes to our state-of-the-art carbon fiber plant in Moses Lake, Washington. Further production steps are being made in Germany. Non-crimped fabrics and non-wovens made from recycled production of cards are being manufactured in Wackersdorf, Germany. Stacking of the non-crimped fabric plies is done in Wackersdorf by BMW. In addition, carbon fibers are being converted by other sub-suppliers into braided preforms and pre pricked patches. So what you see here are the five steps of the entire value chain we had to set up. We started doing so in 2009. We had to be done by 2013, ramping up everything for the start of production of the BMW i3 at the time. That was in um, late uh, 2013. So we basically had from um, um, closing, uh, closing the contracts um, to uh, starting up, uh, ramping up production, series production. We basically had, well, we didn't have more than uh, um, three and a half years. So that was really um, a very interesting time. Besides developing the products and the underlying production technologies, we had to build the plants from scratch. The carbon fiber plant in Moses Lake was erected between 2010 and 2014 uh, with an installed capacity of more than 8,500 metric tons. The oxidation process is fueled with electric energy generated from hydropower. All carbon fiber lines are based on the same design. The first lines built have been retrofitted to resemble the newer lines, benefiting from the learnings made over time. Hence. In Moses Lake, we have a plant with the most modern abatement technology to comply with the stringent environmental standards. Statistical process control and traceability from polymer production in Otake to pot manufacture in Germany are core principles of our production system. Wackersdorf, with its unique unidirectional fabrics, tailor-made for the requirements of large volume series production, is the largest carbon fiber textile plant on the globe. Exchangeability is key to our supply chain. Therefore, any part can be made from any combination of spinning line, carbon fiber line, or warp knitting machine of our qualified supply chain. This allows for immediate response to changes in demand. And rest assured, this was really crucial during the startup of the entire production. So this was key to setting up this supply chain. The plants in Moses Lake and Wackersdorf are connected to a common manufacturing and quality software system. 
This slide here shows the 34 different CFRP parts of the BMW i3 and how the passenger compartment is composed. 32 parts are made from our non cramped fabrics and two are braided profiles. So this means already a significant reduction in parts compared to the steel, um, to the conventional steel designs. Looking at the graphics, it becomes obvious that BMW relied on the so-called shell design, which is common for current steel bodies, to ensure low tech times for high production volumes. Using a predefined set of non-crimped fabrics offers advantages regarding productivity, but results in higher waste. Reinforcing the load pass with CFRP or li limiting the use of fabrics to flat parts led to, to the design of the recent BMW 7 Series. The significant weight saving of the BMW 7 Series is achieved through a multi-material mix. Center roof rail, windshield frame, center console reinforcement, and the rocker panel are made from non-crimped fabrics. The B and C pillar reinforcement and the rear shelf are made from carbon fiber non-woven sheet molding compounds. The fascinating thing about this showcase for the state-of-the-art usage of CFRP in vehicles is the multi-material mix. I believe that several of the CFRP product technologies demonstrated in the current BMW 7 series will be applied in more high volume vehicles to come. And I'm not only talking about BMW here, I'm talking about other competitors or other um, car makers applying such technologies. All the carbon fiber parts are integrated at the assembly line in Dingolfing. There is no specific carbon fiber assembly line. Most of the parts are manufactured on site. What you can see here, for example, on the uh, left hand um, um, corner, the side roof frame, that is a braided part, a braided part we manufacture um, in, in, in the north of Germany. Um, the, um, the C pillar, we produce the um, non woven materials, the basis for the sheet molding compounds, which then are made from that, um, that uh, fleece material we produce. Um, the uh, rear shelf, again, is a, is a fleece material we produce. Um, the center console reinforcement, um, several plies of uh, non crimped fabrics. Um, in a um, wet pressing, in a compression molding process, then you see the rocker panel, also non crimped fabrics made from uh, several plies of uh, 50K carbon fibers in a RTM process. And all of that is integrated into the lightweight chassis um, comprising of aluminum, steel, press hardened steel, and CFRP. And I think that is really amazing how th all of that integrates um, into one uh, vehicle. Now let's have a glimpse at even lower tack times. In, our, in one of our composite component plants in um, Ort Austria, uh, we are producing several hundred thousand leaf springs per dedicated RTM leaf spring manufacturing line. To be fair, these are glass fiber parts due to the better cost requirement ratio over carbon fiber leaf springs. However, it proves that structural composite parts can be manufactured in highly automated production lines with stringent inline process and quality control at low tech times less than a minute. So we are talking about tech times less than a minute here for a composite part which is used in a structural application. And this is being used in um, what you can see here, front leaf springs for VW car, um, in rear leaf springs um, for the VW and the Mercedes, and rear leaf springs for the Volvo um, X, um, XC90 um, vehicles more than uh, 500,000 pieces per year. As I said before, the victory tour of carbon fiber composites in automotive and aerospace depends on material utilization. Therefore, waste reduction in combination with low tech times is crucial. 
Tau frags and braided parts offer excellent material utilization, but still st suffer from long cycle times. Those must be reduced to become successful. Otherwise, high capital expenditure and operating costs will lead to negative business cases. So again, it's always about the combination of reducing waste along the entire manufacturing um, chain, supply chain, and um, of course having a good business case with very low tech times. Another learning came from the already existing production systems in the automotive industry. Statistical process control and inline quality inspection had to be adopted rather than non-destructive testing of each part at the end of the process. We had to develop inline inspection systems for the manufacture of non crimp fabrics at high speeds. Um, with the textile lines, we are talking here about uh, two to 300 meters per, per hour for the manufacture of all those um, um, textiles. Processing the vast amount of data, the width of such a material is more than three meters. Making inline decisions of a respective area of fabric is in spec or out of spec and flagging the failure zone in a digital map were quite challenging. As already stated, we must maintain traceability from polymer to finished part. Let's draw the conclusions now. What are the learnings the aerospace and defense industry may take from the automotive industry's experience with large series CFRP production at low tech times? First, the design process has to be adopted to series production. Less variance and more common parts help reducing the part-specific capital expenditure of automated series manufacturing technologies. In addition, the tool design for such processes should incorporate solutions for minute variations in part geometry. Second, to reduce cost along the value chain, standard materials should be defined and implemented as we did with our 50K carbon fiber and with our um, non crimp fabric material set, which was optimized for minimum variation of properties and for the downstream textile manufacturing steps. Third, automated manufacturing processes with short cycle times should be adopted to minimize capex. In addition to the former learnings, the focus has to be put on waste reduction, i.e. using carbon fibers where it makes sense and not try to have carbon fibers everywhere because that will not work from a business case perspective. Statistical process control rather than certification of the individual part if applicable. And last but not least, on inline quality inspection. In a nutshell, I do believe that the aerospace industry can learn from the experience gained in automotive. Maybe you can avoid some of the mistakes we made before. Different work packages have to be realized before the next generation of commercial single aisle aircraft enters into service with a significant amount of carbon fibers. The design has to be adopted for low tech times and material choices must be made carefully to result in the best performance to cost ratio. Carbon fibers are not the answer to everything. Regarding cost in general, many topics have to be taken care of. Cost of carbon fiber itself being only one part of the equation. To bring down the part cost, the focus has to be put on the entire value chain. Of course, composites manufacturing itself defines a lot of the cost and faster, less capital intensive processes have to be implemented. Not to be forgotten is the know-how that has to be built up jointly. None of the OEMs can be successful without the strong collaboration with its suppliers and the support from academia and research. However, if we learn from each other, I do believe that at the end of the next decade, we will see more carbon fiber composites in the aerospace and defense industry, and maybe even in the next generation of single aisle aircraft. Thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to share some of my experience and learnings with you. Okay, so thank you for texting your questions. Uh, we have a, a few questions and we'll spend about 10 minutes uh, going through those. So first one, 
Andreas, how does automotive address repair issues in the use of carbon fiber? When it comes to the, uh, um, well, to damages in, 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 in the passenger cell, um, those sections are cut out and replaced with, uh, well, with new sections. So these new sections are bonded into these uh, damaged sections. Okay, so uh, related to that, recycling of vehicles at the end of the life of the vehicle is pretty important in automotive. Have you considered recycling opportunities for CFRP parts? Yes, um, we are looking basically at two different aspects of recycling. One is um, during the manufacturing process. As I said before, we recycle the um, off cuts coming from the process. We make uh, um, non-wovens uh, from these parts which are then used in the vehicle. The other thing uh, we do is um, we are developing technologies for end-of-life recycling here and basically um, it, it ends up um, as being um, 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 well reinforcements for um, injection molded parts. The variety and variations of things like fasteners and other components in aerospace can be very mind-boggling. How can standardization contribute to wider adoption of carbon fiber? Well, I think uh, one of the, what I've seen um, over the years is really the challenge, the, the complexity of manufacturing methods um, is so vast that the uh, potential customer um, is overwhelmed with that. And when we come up as an industry with more standardized products, with more standardized solutions, offering really a solution and not throwing a material over the fence, it gets easier for the um, customer to adopt such solutions. And really bringing down the variants, and the variants are not only the pr product variants, but also the potential production technologies which are out there, and we have to limit that. So that is when I talk about standardization, is really we have to um, bring down the amount of options for the customer, because at the end of the day, it, the customer will be overwhelmed. And, and that is for sure um, a roadblock to the implementation, uh, to the adoption of carbon fibers. Excellent. The next two questions are about constraints in, in the adoption and the use of carbon fibers. The first one, and they're very two different questions, but they're both constraint related. First question, what issues exist in the CFRP supply chain? Is there a possibility that heavy use, increased use by automotive and aerospace could cause material shortages? Well, that was the reason for, the, um, for setting up the supply chain, the exclusive supply chain for the BMW at the time, because BMW had the concern at the time that there was not enough carbon fiber available. And they wanted to have a dedicated supply chain. Uh, they had their hands around. That was the reason for setting up a joint venture. Um, but I think this is history, and currently the industry is catching up very fast. That's what we have seen, all the other um, competitors, everybody is um, um, adding capacity, either for aerospace or for automotive um, applications. So I don't see um, a supply shortage in, in the next, uh, in the near future. So talking about supply sh shortages, we have a crisis in terms of skills gap. Trained, sufficiently knowledgeable workers. So. This is the other constraint question. How does the lack of skilled manufacturing workers hinder greater use of composites and what can be done about that? Um, very good question. Yeah, that is one of our biggest concerns. Of course, we need a skilled workforce. What we, um, well, what we have done in, uh, in, in Moses Lake with the community college up there, we have developed uh, several programs in order to um, uh, train people to train operators there, to train our associates. Um, we have to get carbon fibers really into, um, into um, universities, into education. That is really crucial and, and uh, not only uh, lecture on metals, but really 
uh, put the emphasis on, on, on composites. And I think there's still a long way to go um, that it becomes a very um, normal um, material. But yes, you're absolutely right. This is really crucial about the success of com fibers of composites. Why is your CFRP produced at the assembly sites rather than, rather than at a dedicated site? Excuse me, could you? The question was, um, in your presentation, I believe you made the comment that you producing the CFRP at the assembly sites. And the question is, why produce it at the assembly sites versus a dedicated site for CFRP? Okay, um, that depends on the model, even with BMW. Um, with the BMW 7 Series, it is more at the assembly site. With the BMW i3 and i8, it is in dedicated other sites. Mm -hmm. um, so you have both variants, um, obviously, and, and uh, depends always on availability of of building space, uh, labor, or workforce, and stuff like that. So these were the considerations to go down that path. Okay, so someone's thinking out there uh, into that future scenario with a question. Are commercial drones and on-demand mobility, air taxis, a natural transition of automotive composite technology to aerospace applications? Oh, I would love to. That's a very interesting thought. Yes, why not? Why thermoplastics for the future vision? Um, it is um, the combination of glass fiber uh, reinforced plastics with, uh, with carbon fiber reinforcements. So that is what we are thinking about, really very low tack times, uh, below a minute, um, having a larger uh, glass fiber reinforced plastic structure and only smaller sections in there, smaller reinforcements made from from carbon fiber, and that requires then thermoplastic matrix system. So one uh, comment coming in here with a question says, um, I would like to commend the inclusion of the academic industry partnership in the what's next summary slide. Can you state one model of partnership that you've experienced? Yeah, we, what we have set up in, in, in Germany, for example, that is the uh, My Carbon Initiative, that was an initiative uh, um, among different um, companies and also research in institutes focusing on, on uh, the further development of, of uh, CFRP. And that was really helpful, that was very helpful um, throughout the years and was when it started in, well, end of the last decade. So that was, uh, I think, a role model for such a collaboration between research academia and businesses. Okay, and I believe we're down to the last question. You mentioned something related to 5K fabric. Can you explain what that means, and is it related to weight, fiber density, weave pattern? Um, 50K. So we, 50K. We, 50K, yeah. We are, the interesting thing is about, um, at the beginning, of course, of this development process, the BMW engineers investigated all the different sorts of carbon fibers available. And what they did is they really looked at what do we need, what is the requirement here, and not over exceed the requirements, making it more expensive. They said, well, that's what we need, and that is, um, well, can be, can be uh, delivered by um, such a type of carbon fiber we are producing in Moses Lake. And that was what we then built on and, and uh, further developed, further enhanced, making it more usable for the textile manufacturing process. And that is our 50K carbon fiber product in comparison to the standard 3K, 12K, 24K carbon fibers, which are used in aerospace typically. So we had that carbon fiber and had the um, appropriate processes for this uh, to be manufactured in really high volumes with a very low um, variation. Thank you for handling the Q&A. Thank you for starting us out with a great keynote. Would you join me in a round of appreciation?